where are blood cells produced and how are they produced? So that's what this slide is going to discuss. So blood cells, all of them, whether you're a red blood cell, whether you're a white blood cell, whether you're a platelet, are formed in red bone marrow. Uh, red bone marrow is the tissue found kind of protected within spongy bone uh, of many of your, our bones in our skeleton. And in that bone marrow, there are a very special type of cell called a pluripotent stem cell, uh, also known as a hemocytoblast. And these cells have the potential to become any of the blood cells. Okay, so that's what pluripotent means. They can become a lot of different cells. Um, and that's kind of what this drawing is showing. So here's that stem cell, hematos, uh, hemocytoblast, sorry. And depending on its environment, depending on what kind of molecules, uh, hormones, and chemicals are in its uh, vicinity determines what kind of path it might take. So it might take this lymphoid path and become a lymphocyte, all right? Or it might go down this path, what we call the myeloid stem cell path, and then it could take this path and eventually become a red blood cell. Or maybe it takes this path and might eventually become a neutrophil, okay? And there's these kind of intermediate stages but that we're not going to really get into but you'll notice the main point here is you can go from this cell this pluripotent stem cell and depending on where you are you could become any of the formed elements down here at the bottom okay um, so so these are very useful cells um, in fact if someone has say leukemia we can basically destroy their bone marrow, okay, because it's cancerous, and replace it with these pluripotent stem cells, and it'll reform all of their formed elements. All right, so very powerful cells. Uh, so what's the take-home message? Again, that, you know, this process occurs in bone marrow. Uh, it's either referred to as hemopoiesis or hematopoiesis. Uh, both of these means mean producing blood. Um, this stem cell can e take one of two paths kind of early. It can take the myeloid path or the lymphoid path. And then again, based on it, what stimulates that cell, it takes you know a further what we call differentiation uh, into its final um, cell type. Um, some examples of the hormones. So, we're, so all these steps require a lot of different uh, what we call cytokines or hormones. The two that we're going to definitely need to know are the erythropoietin, which is involved in the production of red blood cells. So in order to get this process going, we need a hormone called erythropoietin. Uh, often it's referred to as EPO. Uh, and it's produced by your kidneys. So the kidneys play a really important role in stimulating the production of red blood cells. Then there's one similar for platelets, thrombopoietin. And thrombopoietin is involved in the production and stimulation of more platelets. So if you think about it, if you were to donate blood or um, bleed, maybe you cut yourself, you're going to have to stimulate more of these uh, red blood cells and platelets. So a lot of times your body will then produce these hormones and kind of kick the production of uh, red blood cells in gear and produce more platelets. So let's start with red blood cells or erythrocytes. Erythro means red, cytes, that means it's a cell, so red cells. Um, this is kind of a summary table. Uh, the numbers, I would remember 5 million. So about 5 million red blood cells per microliter. So if we take a microliter of someone's blood, now the question is, well, how much is a microliter? Um, well, I'll remind you, you have 5 liters, roughly, of blood. A microliter, uh, the analogy I like to give is if you take a teardrop, right? Let's say you have a little tear running down your cheek. 
that tier is probably 50 to 100 microliters. So now you have to take just a small fraction of that tier, and you're going to have 5 million uh, red blood cells. Okay, characteristics. Basically, what do they look like? Uh, they're relatively small. Uh, so 78 microns or micrometers in diameter. So the cell has this particular shape to it. We call it a biconcave disc. So it's kind of flattened, and then you have these two concave surfaces. It's almost like a donut that didn't get its whole form properly. Um, and that shape's very important for the function of a red blood cell. Uh, these red blood cells have to be very flexible, uh, to fit through tiny little capillaries. All right, so capillaries are the very smallest blood vessels in the human body, and they can be as small as five microns in diameter. So these things have to somehow figure out a way to fit through some a diameter blood vessel that's smaller than them. Uh, so they have to fold. A lot of times they kind of fold almost like a taco, and fit through these tiny little capillaries. So that shape allows them to do that. If they were just spherical, they wouldn't able to they wouldn't be able to squeeze through the little capillaries. So that shape's very important for their function. They have to be very flexible uh, for their function. They have no nucleus. Okay, so that's interesting. That means a red blood cell isn't really a true cell. Because uh, to be a cell, you have to have all these organelles that we learn about, you know, in AMP1 or in a biology class. But through their maturation in bone marrow, they lose a nucleus. And you can go back and look. Let's maybe go back a sec right here. And notice that at this stage right here, this cell, this late erythroblast, spits out its nucleus. Okay. So it loses the nucleus, and that's what kind of allows this red blood cell to have that biconcave shape, because the nucleus is no longer taking up all that room. Okay? Now, when you don't have a nucleus, or you're anucleate, you've got problems, because you're not going to be able to make new proteins, you're not going to be able to replicate into, say, two, two cells, so you have a, what we call a finite lifespan, all right? So when you're produced, the clock's ticking, all right? And about how long a red blood cell lasts in circulation kind of depends on, you know, how it, how it goes, you know, are you, if you get damaged or not. But typically we use about 120 days, all right? So a red blood cell will be made. It'll circulate around in your bloodstream doing its thing. Uh, transporting oxygen and carbon dioxide. And then after 100, 120 days, it gets worn out, all right, because it hasn't been able to, you know, repair itself if something got damaged. It's been squeezing through little capillaries. So we got to get rid of those old ones, okay, and replace them with nice new ones. So throughout your life, you're constantly producing new red blood cells, and removing the old red blood cells. Functions. So the key function, again, transport your gases. Transport most of the oxygen and then a good amount of the carbon dioxide. Not all the carbon dioxide gets transported in red blood cells, but um, a good, good portion of it, about 23% of the carbon dioxide, gets transported it by red blood cells. Whereas when it comes to oxygen, about 98, 98 and a half percent of the oxygen gets transported. What transports it? Hemoglobin. So a red blood cell is basically a, a, a package of hemoglobin. Uh, throughout this red blood cell, it's just loaded with the protein hemoglobin. Uh, so a red blood cell has roughly 300 million hemoglobin molecules uh, within it, okay? And with 300 million hemoglobin molecules, they can transport about a billion oxygen molecules, all right? Uh, so how to understand what a red blood cell does, you got to understand a hemoglobin molecule, all right, which we'll look at down here. 
uh, since red blood cells are the most abundant formed element, uh, remember roughly 45%, give or take, uh, they contribute most to the viscosity of blood, the thickness of blood. So if red blood cell numbers go up, blood might become more viscous. If red blood cell numbers go down, the blood might become a little thinner or less viscous. And viscosity contributes to blood pressure. Um, if viscosity gets really, really high, blood pressure can get really, really high. Uh, and the opposite is true with low viscosity. So let's look at hemoglobin. It's got different parts to it. So you'll notice that this kind of snake-like portion, that's known as globin. Globin is the protein portion of hemoglobin. And there's four of those globin subunits. You'll notice that there's one here, one here, one here, and one here. So there's four globin components. Each globin contains a molecule called heme. All right, so that's how they got the hemoglobin. All right, and heme is kind of this ring-like molecule. It's not a protein, so often it's just referred to as a non-protein. It's also what's going to give the pigmentation to your blood, um, so it makes, makes that blood look red. That's because of the heme. And then in the center of each heme is an iron atom. All right, Fe is the symbol for iron. Okay, and then that's where oxygen attaches. Oxygen needs that iron. So if you're deficient in iron, you won't have the ability to attach oxygen to that, that heme molecule. So I often tell students, think of hemoglobin as a 4x4. Four four. It has four units, and each unit has four components. A globin, a heme, an iron, and then an, potentially an oxygen. Okay? All right, so let's talk a little more about red blood cells. Uh, loading of hemoglobin, we often use HB as an a abbreviation for hemoglobin, with oxygen occurs in the lungs, right? Oxygen enters from the lungs into the blood. We call that oxygenation, okay? That le is going to lead to that nice bright red uh, blood. And the hemoglobin that's holding the oxygen is referred to as oxyhemoglobin. Kind of makes sense, okay? Uh, when it unloads oxygen, okay, so now we're going to deliver oxygen into tissue. We call that deoxygenation. Notice the color changes. It gets a little more dark red. And then when that hemoglobin has delivered the oxygen, we call that deoxyhemoglobin, okay? Now, there's a couple other gases that can attach to hemoglobin. Carbon dioxide can. So hemoglobin can transport carbon dioxide. We call that form of hemoglobin carbaminohemoglobin. Okay, so it's transporting carbon dioxide. And then you've got another gas called carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is the one you don't want to deal with. All right, carbon monoxide is one that you can breathe in similar to oxygen. So it could be in the atmosphere, okay? And the problem with carbon monoxide is it binds really tightly to hemoglobin. So if you've got some of this carbon monoxide in the air you're breathing, it'll attach to hemoglobin and won't let oxygen attach. And that's not good, all right, because it attaches so tightly it, can, it can't get removed from the hemoglobin. So now when the hemoglobin comes back through the lungs a second time, it still has carbon monoxide attached. So now it might attach even more carbon monoxide. All right, and we call that carbon monoxide poisoning. All right, carbon monoxide is produced from combustible engines, uh, car engines, uh, generators, uh, some... Um, furnaces and, and heaters that might use gas as their power. Uh, pretty dangerous stuff. Uh, and, and a big problem is it's odorless. So you could have carbon monoxide and, and not know it. Uh, let's look at some other measurements. 
We can measure just the hemoglobin content of blood. So that's going to be useful, just like the hematocrit. Uh, it might help us diagnose anemia. So in females, the hemoglobin content is somewhere around 12 to 16 grams per deciliter. And then in males, as you could probably assume, since we have uh, more red blood cells, the, the hemoglobin content is going to be higher, 14 to 18. And typically there's a ratio. So if you take the hematocrit and the hemoglobin, it's typically a 3 to 1 ratio. So that might kind of help might help you remember some of these numbers a little better. Um, they'll also look at the volume of the red blood cells. So here's that nice normal red blood cell. And this is called mean corpuscular volume or MCV. Uh, a normal one, the number is between 80 to 100. Uh, if you've got little tiny red blood cells, uh, that's numbers below 80. And then you could have these large red blood cells uh, where, where it's over 100. All right, you want these guys. You don't want either of these, okay? All right, how do we make a red blood cell? So we've seen this. This is that same image we looked pr at previously, but we're, now we're just looking at this, this component of it. So how do we get from here? that pluripotent stem cell, to here, the red blood cell. It goes through a number of different stages. All right, remember, eventually it spits out the nucleus. Notice here, this is like the stage right before a nice fully formed red blood cell. It's called a reticulocyte. So reticulocytes are super immature red blood cells. They're, they're just about to become a red blood cell. And we can measure the amount of those in someone's bloodstream. So why would someone have a high number of reticulocytes? Well, that means for some reason their body's generating more red blood cells. So maybe they've been bleeding and have lost blood, so now they're regenerating those red blood cells, so then their reticulocyte count might go up. All right. So maybe they have internal bleeding. All right. Internal bleeding is pretty hard to to diagnose because obviously you can't see it. But if they do a routine blood workup and find that the reticulocyte count is really high, that might give them uh, a little bit of uh, evidence uh, that they have some internal bleeding and the body is trying to replace those lost red blood cells. All right, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, the hormone, the really important hormone to remember, erythropoietin, or EPO. Um, this is a direct stimulus for erythropoiesis, which is the production of red blood cells. Uh, this hormone is released by the kidneys, typically in response to hypoxia, which is low oxygen. So low oxygen levels being transported. Uh, this could be due to loss of blood, uh, it could be due to loss of red blood cells. It could be due to low hemoglobin or iron deficiencies. Uh, it could be caused by high altitudes. So for some reason, your blood has, has uh, a, a, a problem transporting oxygen. There's just not enough oxygen being transported. That's going to tell the kidney that one way we can at least try to get more oxygen transportation is produce more red blood cells. So that's going to stimulate the kidney to produce EPO. EPO goes to the target, which is bone marrow, and the bone marrow makes more red blood cells. All right? And then the opposite is it happens if you've got, you know, plenty of oxygen or even too much oxygen, you can actually decrease red blood cell counts. Uh, EPO is often used as a medication as well. So notice that it's, you know, kidney is a big player. So if someone has kidney disease, right, kidney isn't functioning, or maybe they're on one kidney now, uh, they might have a lack of EPO production. Uh, and what might happen to them is they'll develop anemia because they don't have enough red blood cells. Uh, well, you can treat this. You can give someone uh, EPO. So EPO can be used to treat certain forms of anemia uh, due to low EPO numbers um, or low EPO concentration. Um, a lot of athletes figured this out back in the day that, you know, there is such a thing as EPO, uh, and they got their hands on it, and they were taking it illegally. 
uh, in, a, in an effort to get more red blood cells produced so they can distribute more oxygen throughout their body and maybe they can, you know, ride a bicycle uh, uh, better in a, a say, a, a bicycle race or, or a triathlon or, or one of those races. Uh, then, you know, we discovered that there's a test for this EPO and they kind of banned that. Uh, and then towards the end of these blood uh, doping scandals, uh, these athletes were actually drawing out their own blood, uh, storing it, letting the body re replace those blood cells naturally, and then putting that blood back into their system. And that could, again, boost their red blood cells and allow them to uh, function better in the, in the performance. Uh, so you might have heard of Lance Armstrong in the cycling world. Uh, he was doing those things. Uh, I'm going to... Keep going. Let's keep going. We can do this. Let's just keep plowing through these red blood cells. So we're going to enter the world of the life cycle of a red blood cell. So we're kind of going to go from the production of the red blood cell until we have to remove that red blood cell. And then what do we do with all the parts? Uh, what do we do with that, all that hemoglobin uh, that's in the red blood cell? And there's two figures. There's this figure or this slide, and then there's another slide on the next um Another figure in the next slide. I actually like the next one better. Um, so I'm going to go quickly through this one, uh, but then focus more on the next slide. So um, you can see we're kind of starting with the kidney, right? Because the kidney is going to stimulate the production of red blood cells in the bone marrow. Uh, they're going to circulate, right? So now we see that new red blood cell enters, uh, and it's going to circulate. And while it's circulating, it's doing its job. It's transporting oxygen and carbon dioxide. Now at some point these red blood cells get old and worn out and they need to be removed from circulation. So the old red blood cells are actually removed by three organs. The spleen can do it, the liver can do it, and bone marrow can do it. Now typically you want your spleen's doing it. Um, but if you don't have a spleen, some people get their spleen removed, uh, the liver and the bone marrow will do this. So what they do is they will take the old or damaged red blood cells. There are specific types of cells called macrophages that will actually phagocytose and break down the hemoglobin. All right, so it breaks down all that hemoglobin into its main components, globin, iron, and heme. Unfortunately, heme is non-recyclable. All right, meaning you can't do anything with this heme, you can't reuse it. Globin you can reuse, iron you can reuse. But what happens to heme is it changes, it gets metabolized, uh, and then eventually it gets eliminated from the body. Okay, and we're going to talk about some of these metabolites. Bilirubin is one of the metabolites, stercobilin is a metabolite. A metabolite's basically the molecule, heme, but it got changed a little bit, okay, uh, while we're trying to get rid of it, okay? So the figure I like to use is this one. It's a little scary at first glance because uh, it seems to be a lot going on, uh, but this actually is one of my favorite figures uh, because it's involving all kinds of different organs, um, and once you kind of get through it, it's, it, it, it's very important because you can apply this to some other medical or clinical uh, connections. So what we're going to do is we're going to start right here. All right, makes sense to start if you're doing a life cycle. You're starting where the red blood cell was made or where it was born, if you will. Okay, so here's a bone. This is the femur. Inside this femur, there's bone marrow. What else do we need in there? We need the hormone. All right, EPO is going to stimulate this process. We're going to need some vitamins. There's a couple important vitamins. We're going to need B12 for this process. That's a required vitamin for erythropoiesis. We also need folic acid. That's another important vitamin. Uh, we're going to need to make the protein. All right, so we're going to need to make globin, and we're going to need iron. All right, we got all those goodies. We got some other stuff, and we make that nice red blood cell. Okay, circulates, all right, 120 days, doing its thing. Then it gets old, 
And here's where it's getting phagocytosed. So this represents one of those macrophages found in your spleen, liver, or bone marrow. All right. It takes those old red blood cells, breaks them all down. What do you get? You get a ton of globin. All right. That's the protein. What can we do with that? Well, we can break it down further into amino acids and then just use those amino acids for something. So globin's a nice recyclable and reusable component. Let's look at the iron. So the iron gets pulled off the heme and then it gets transferred. All right, there's a, a, a transporter called transferrin. Basically, it transports iron. You can transport it over to the liver, all right, where it can be stored. All right, iron can actually be stored in your liver. Uh, if we need more of it, we can then transfer it again, maybe back to the bone marrow. So now you got iron that's being reused. The problem comes with heme. So again, heme is non-renewable, can't use it. And anything the body can't use anymore, we like to eliminate it or excrete it from the body. But through this process, it changes, all right? It becomes different metabolites. The first, one of the first metabolites is called biliverdin. Notice the color here. Uh, it's a green pigment instead of a red pigment. Remember, the red comes from the heme. But if you change heme, all of a sudden it reflects a different color. All right, so biliverdin gets produced. Then it becomes what's called bilirubin. Bilirubin is kind of an orangish yellow pigment. It gets transferred to your liver, all right? So now your liver has this bilirubin, all right? And the liver's a really smart organ. It knows it's got to get rid of bilirubin. And one of the things your liver produces is a secretion called bile. And bile functions in your intestines, all right? And we'll talk more about bile another day. But the liver thinks, all right, well, if I'm putting bile into the small intestines, why don't I just put bilirubin into bile, and it'll get into the intestines. And that's a way out, right? One way out of the body is through the GI tract. So bilirubin goes into the small intestine. It changes a bit in your small intestine because there's bacteria in your intestines. So it changes into these other metabolites. Uh, one of them gets reabsorbed back into the body, and you can then pee it out in urine. So urobilin is a, a molecule found in urine. Or it can change into one called stercobilin. Stercobilin, notice the color. Stercobilin reflects a brown wavelength, a brownish color. All right, And that's the color of normal feces. So what you just learned is why urine is yellow and why feces is brown. All right, all because of this heme molecule that changed forms as we eliminated it or excreted it from the body. All right, so you can go tell people, go tell your friends, go tell your family members why their urine is yellow and why their poop is brown. All right, now, more medically relevant is if the liver isn't functioning, what might happen? Well, if their liver isn't functioning properly, maybe the individual has hepatitis or cirrhosis of the liver from alcoholism, or maybe you're a newborn and your liver just hasn't really started working yet. This molecule will accumulate in the body if it's not able to get passed into the small intestine. And the buildup of bilirubin in the body causes what we call jaundice. And jaundice is where you find a discoloration of the white part of the eyes. The, the sclera of the eyes becomes a little orangish yellow. Skin might turn a little orangish. Mucous membranes turn, turn orangish yellow. All right? So it's a complicated figure, but if you take your time and walk through it, it's really cool because then you can apply it to uh, other relevant topics such as uh, jaundice. All right, we're going to take a break there. Um, we'll end this video. 
We're still talking red blood cells, so we got a little bit to do about on red on red blood cells. Um, so I just want to make this video not not so lengthy. So we'll pick up on anemia in the next video.